chapter 6. Uh, I believe that hopefully in 13 weeks I will return and finish chapter 7 through 13. But uh, we'll try to uh, take our time and do as much as chapter 6 this morning as possible. And Oh, you can't. I can. It would help if I turn the microphone on. Better? Okay. Thank you. I'll start oh, over. Oh, oh. Welcome Welcome to Bible Ranch. Ranch. My name is Tim Fisher, and I'm teaching Hebrews. We're on chapter 6, and this is the final week of this quarter. And I'd like to thank everybody for their attendance and comments, and certainly uh, we will hopefully in 13 weeks pick up where we left off at and finish Hebrews. It has been a... Uh, challenging book to teach, I will say that, and uh, I appreciate your attention and comments. Before we start, let's go to God in prayer for a moment. Father, we're thankful for the book of Hebrews that God the Holy Spirit has inspired. Father, we pray as we read this that we will, as the Hebrews author was encouraging the audience there to mature in our Christianity and therefore not fall into apostasy. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm going to read... Uh, the first 12 verses of chapter 6, and uh, I've entitled this chapter, Jesus is the Anchor of a Better Hope. Hopefully it will reach chapter, verse 19, where it talks about Jesus as an anchor. I'm going to re be reading from the NASB this morning, the New American Standard Bible. Um, as I mentioned, I've been using different English translations. I understand that everybody here does not use the exact translation. And the NASB is probably the most word for word, as I mentioned, English translation to Greek. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this way we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and produces vegetation useful to those whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But, it yields, but if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. The author's words uh, at the first of this chapter seem to be a, a little bit unusual. At, if you remember at the last of chapter 5, he was rebuking them for their immaturity and lack of learning, and actually stated, maybe you need to be taught again. But then the Holy Spirit Press, you know, directs him to press onward. He says, therefore, leaving the elementary teachings. And this is certainly a change from his previous position. Maybe you need to be taught again, but I'm being directed by the Holy Spirit to move on to more complex teaching. So maybe the author feels that Moving on to this more advanced teaching about Jesus Christ as our high priest 
according to the order of Melchizedek, is going to strengthen them to where they will not commit apostasy. So, in the author's mind, they need to understand the exact meaning of Christ's priesthood. We need to understand the meaning of Christ's priesthood and his atoning sacrifice. It was the duty of the high priest, if you remember, on the Day of Atonement to go into the tabernacle, and later the temple, on the Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, to offer sins for himself and his family, then for the sins of the people. However, Jesus, being this perfect sacrifice, only had to make it once, and it was forever. And these Hebrew Christians, which are of Jewish background, they need to understand this priesthood of Jesus, and they need to abandon Judaism. They need to follow Christ and his teachings. And the author's going to list some basic teachings that don't really need to be reemphasized. Wrong direction. The author uses the word foundation, and he's using it as a metaphor. And for some of the basic instructions given to these Jewish Christians when they were converted, it needs to be noted that this list is, is not a complete list. Um, you know, if I told you that I was going to a grocery store and I picked up vegetables, um, and I told you maybe I got some peppers and tomatoes. Um, maybe I got some other things, right? Um, usually would. Um, you know, that it's a broad term. And uh, these fundamentals, it's not a complete list of fundamentals, but it's what we call a syndectic. Um, and it's where a figure of speech, there, part of it stands for the whole. And we should not conclude that this was the only teaching given to new converts. However, uh, these were Jewish converts, and maybe it gives us an insight to what was regarded as fundamental to teaching Jewish converts instead of Gentile converts. Now, the author mentions that this list is a foundational list, and he assumes that his audience is familiar with them and also accepts them. He's not encouraging that they abandon this list, but he wants to build upon it. When people are converted, do they perhaps have a complete understanding of everything that a Christian should know? Absolutely not. More than likely not. Um, there are certain foundational items that are necessary to become a Christian. What would you say is foundational? Correct. Repentance and baptism. Belief. Confession. So there are some things that we should all agree on. And if we don't, there, it's a problem. And there was this teaching to these Jewish converts that there were some foundational things they should certainly believe on. And the author is going to give it six items, but it's, it's really given as three pairs. And it's two lists in the Greek, but uh, there's the first two, then the next four. But, you know, the author wants to move on, but I certainly can't, okay? I'm going to discuss what these mean and go into a little bit of depth on them. So the author wants to leave these elementary principles, which we're going to discuss, and he wants to move on to perfection. That's the, term, the word in the New King James Version. If you look at the NIV, 
the ESV, the NESV, it's going to use the word maturity. I like that word a little better. Um, and the Greek word is teleotes. Um, it means completeness. Uh, so the words express purpose and encouragement to the audience. Remember when we talked about Jesus attaining perfection, it wasn't that he was morally perfect. He always was. However, perfection means completing a task. All right? And there are six items that the author lists here that he considers as foundational that they should have mastered. And here they are in verses 1 and 2. Repentance from dead works and faith. Doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands. Resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. What is repentance from dead works and faith toward God? This phrase, repentance from dead works, is unique to Hebrews. There's a lot of unique words to Hebrews and phrases. However, this one certainly is. The author is going to use the phrase again in chapter 9, verse 14, to be exact. There's a possibility that dead works could refer to the sacrificial rites of the Old Testament, but really a better interpretation of dead works is a reference to our own sinful practices. Um, repentance and faith. This precedes one's entrance into Christianity. You cannot become a Christian without having repentance and faith. Um, they're the items that are first taught to sinful men. And we could go into repentance, but repentance basically carries the idea of changing how you think. And if you can change the way you think, you can change the way that you live and act. So if I'm to grow as a Christian, each of us, I have to be willing to change how I think, and how I act. Is that not correct? We must have faith towards God. If you look at the root word of faith, pestis, it means to believe. There are really, to me, three basic components of faith. Uh, you accept what God says, you trust in what God says, and you act on what God says. And I, you could simplify it to that. So, there's this belief that you accept, you trust, and you act on what God says. If you look at Paul's writings, Romans 1.17 states, the righteous shall live by faith. Romans 4.12 states that we walk by faith. All right? Obviously, faith can be used in different connotations. It's a lifestyle here that Paul is describing. I must live my life in accordance to the teachings of Jesus, not only Jesus, but the other inspired writers of the New Testament. And this includes leaving sin and living a moral, righteous lifestyle. Instructions about washings or laying on of hands. In Ephesians 4.1, it states that there is one baptism. The New King James does a, a poor job translating the Greek word baptismos here as the doctrine of baptisms. Baptismos, the word is found two other places in the New Testament, Mark 7.4 and later on in Hebrews uh, 9.10. And it refers to the Levitical purity rites. So these were the ceremonial washings of the Jews. Would it be important to a Jew, if you were teaching a Jew about baptism, that they certainly had their mikvahs, their, their uh, ceremonial washings, where they could go in seven steps and... <clears throat> 
be baptized also, but they would also have washings to, for purification purposes. The difference, they were taught the difference between the Christian baptism and these ritual washings for purity. These Jewish ceremonial washings weren't necessary anymore. You aren't following the Old Testament. You're following the teachings of the New Covenant. So they needed to leave these traditions behind. So we can apply this to us nowadays. Um, We can apply this to us leaving our past traditions of life. It's really easy to me to get locked down in a comfort zone in religion. Uh, And we don't pay attention to what the scripture actually says and what the Bible, I mean, what people say and what the Bible actually says. And if you're not careful, you can end up paying attention to what somebody says about the Bible more so than what the Bible actually states. And if that's the case, you end up defending tradition more so than what Scripture states. And as I mentioned previously, traditions are only as good as they are consistent with the Bible. And that we need to totally understand. Now, the laying on of hands could be interpreted in three different ways. It's used that way in the New Testament. It could indicate the endowment of the Holy Spirit, which are the spiritual gifts. We see them in Acts. And this is really probably the correct interpretation here, what the laying on of hands means. If we, laying on of hands could also be conferring a blessing. Remember Jesus in Matthew 19, you know, laying his hands on the children. And it could be a symbol of giving a task where example would be the Antioch church uh, laying their hands on Paul and Barnabas. It's the sort of uh, like we're with you. We're authorizing you to do this. Now, the last two, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, they're definitely closely related. There are two things that you can count on at the end of your life, and that is that you are going to be resurrected after your death at some time, and there's going to be a judgment. Hebrews 9.27 states that it is appointed for men to die once, And after this is the judgment. I could talk a little bit about this verse a little bit more, but we'll come to more discussion when we talk about Hebrews 9. However, uh, this carries the idea we mentioned of sifting the good from the bad. Um, So people are going to die once. That is why Jesus only died once. He was human. And uh, then the judgment. And we have to understand, as these Hebrew Christians have to understand also, that there's going to be a time that we are going to stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ. Now to add some context to the next few verses, the passage regarding apostasy, There are certainly people in this world that do not believe in apostasy. They don't believe that you can fall away. Um, There are people whose religious beliefs are that God has a sovereign power, that there are people that are predestined to be saved, and there are people predestined to be lost before God created anything. And there's nothing that you can do about it 
to change that. It is God's sovereignty. Now, certainly God predestined people. However, you are predestined in the aspect in that you have followed the gospel, and God knew who would follow the gospel. Not that we're predestined to have some type of miraculous uh, event that happens to us to become one of the, quote, elect. Close quote. So you have to understand that Hebrews, in several places, talks about apostasy. And if apostasy was not possible, why would you talk about it in the first place? It would be useless, right? <clears throat> so we have to understand in context that the author has been discussing the wilderness generation. And what happened to the wilderness generation? Did they apostatize? Absolutely. They rebelled. They rebelled against God, and they died in the wilderness. And it wasn't, the, the issue wasn't that God was not willing to forgive them. The issue was that they were not Turn it on, works better. There we go. Use my finger. Um, they were not willing to repent of their unbelief and rebellious spirit. So these Jewish Christians are questioning their faith under hardships. Remember, they're being persecuted. And they were enduring these persecutions, and they were in danger of apostatizing. So if you look at verses 4 through 6 in talking about apostasy, it's really one long sentence. It's like the first three verses in chapter 1 uh, in Greek. It's one long sentence, and the author is going to make his point why you need to advance beyond elementary principles of the Christian religion. And his, he's trying to get across to them that if you don't progress, it means you're regressing. There's no status quo as a Christian. And, and that's got consequences if you regress. And the warning is severe. There's a call to move on and progress in faith. Now, if you're reading the New King James Version, which I've, many of you are, possibly, um, you'll see the word if in verse 6, and it's italicized, okay? It's an inserted word. In the original Greek, this word is not there, okay? Okay. Um, so it first came out in the Tyndall version, which was before the King James version. It was incorporated into the King James version and later on into the New King James version. If you look at the ASV, the American Standard Version, and the ESV, which is, they based, came off the RSV, then the ASV, it states, and they fall. And it states off stating um, four you know, verse 4, for it is impossible. Now, if I tell you something's impossible, that means it can never happen, right? Um, so, um, it's impossible, according to the author, that people who truly apostatize to return back to the church. And it's really an impressive way to begin a sentence. So, when can we say to people who were once Christians, who have chosen to leave the Christian faith, the door's closed to you now. 
You can't come back. So when is repentance impossible? It's a practical question. And the author is going to answer it. In the religious world today, generally speaking, there's a very gracious posture towards apostasy. Um, many denominations in Christianity hold the position that as long as people want to come back, we'll welcome them back, they can sin, they can leave the church, they can return back to the church, go back to sinning, return back to the church, and we'll keep welcoming them back. The early church never, never documents this. The early church did discuss that how often and even if a person was allowed to return back to the church once they left it. So the question is, who cannot come back? Those, it states, for it is impossible, that's verse 4, those who have been once enlightened. What does that mean? It means really those that had obeyed the gospel. It's a, it's a one-time experience, okay? It's, you're only converted once, is that correct? Um, that you become a Christian one time. So these people that had once been enlightened, and notice the once is past tense. Those who had tasted the heavenly gift. And this is probably a reference to salvation, the experience of having your sins forgiven and the blessings they had received. It states, those who had shared in the Holy Spirit. This is probably a reference to the miraculous gifts, people who had miraculous gifts. Also, it is impossible those who had tasted the goodness of God's word and the powers of the age to come. And this again is probably referring to those who had heard the word, converted, repented, baptized, who later on received miraculous abilities by the Holy Spirit. So this affirmation that apostasy is not only possible, but it's absolutely certain when they forsake the faith. For it is impossible that they fall away to renew them again unto repentance. So it's clear from this passage that people, these people are in a special class, all right? If you look at the New Testament, it's obviously clear that repentance is taught. If you look at Galatians 1, 1 John chapter 1, there's, if people are repentant, there is pardon for sins. We can be assured, reading the New Testament and what is taught, that if we truly repent and ask for forgiveness, that the Lord will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why then, in this case, in Hebrews, is there no forgiveness a possibility? The answer really is in the nature of the apostasy. These people are not ordinary apostates. How many people in here are perfect? Absolutely none. We all sin. Obviously, there are people sin, and we are weak. We yield to temptation. Sometimes it's stupidity. Sometimes it's indifference to something. And sometimes just being tempted. And however, these people that 
the author is discussing. They had denied Christ and returned to Judaism. All right? That is the apostasy that is being discussed here. This was a permanent rejection of the gospel, and they, they rejected that you could only be saved through one plan, and that plan is Jesus Christ. So does Hebrew 4, 6 teach that it's impossible to repent? No, it doesn't. However, there, there are, there's a lot of things to consider in this passage. The author is just, he's not simply writing about people that miss church once in a while. Um, he's speaking of apostasy. When we speak of apostasy, we are leaving the church for good and not of singular sins. As I mentioned, there's no need to teach about apostasy unless it's possible. When you apostatize, you remove yourself from standing with God, and that is a severe offense. When you apostatize, you are leaving Christ, you're embracing a life of sin, and this is inconsistent with a life of a Christian, a life devoted to Christ. And it's a willful, understand that term, willful rebellion. If you look at Hebrews 1026, the author is going to discuss willful sin. In the Old Testament, willful sin could not be atoned for. When the priest on the Day of Atonement went into the tabernacle or temple to make amends for sins, willful sin could not be forgiven. And the author, there was just no sacrifice for it. And the author's going to make this statement later on in chapter 10 that there is no atoning sacrifice of Christ for willful sin. So that you need to understand. Now, repentance is the key on allowing people to return back to Christ or even to come to Christ in the first place, correct? And uh, it's the key factor on determining whether somebody can or cannot be forgiven. There seems to be a point that people leave the church and never can be restored back to the church. Can we get more specific? So does it mean that you can't accept their repentance or it's impossible for them to repent? So let's discuss it. There's some possible interpretations of this passage. If you look at the word impossible, udunados, um, it's used in relation also later in the chapter, in verse 18, when it says that it's impossible for God to lie. Um, it's Im the word impossible, how is it impossible? That's a good question. Um, there's been various past opinions of this passage, and it's a stern warning. When somebody tells you that something's impossible, you better pay attention. And one interpretation of the passage has been this, is that once a Christian commits apostasy, he can never repent of this action. Now, if you look at the writings of the early church, this was a, a frequently held position by them when persecution was going on. There were Christians that would leave the church when there was persecution to avoid persecution in the first place, and then they would come back later when the persecution died down. Now, if you look at 
if you hold that position that the early church did, that the phrase crucify again and totally makes sense. This intentional behavior, which is premeditated repentance. When I say premeditated repentance, I did something willfully. And did I just not say that willful sin cannot be forgiven? All right. Later on in chapter 10, the author of Hebrews is going to make that very statement. So if I willfully know that I'm going to leave the church because times are hard and I don't want to get persecuted, but later on I know that I'm going to come back to the church when things are better and I'm going to be accepted back into the fold, that's premeditated repentance. And and you, the church in the early days did not tolerate this. We shouldn't tolerate it. Um, you cannot take back your faith in times of persecution and expect to be forgiven by God. In fact, does it not state at several places in the New Testament that, that trials and temptations are good? to grow in your faith. Yes, certainly does. So, um, that totally makes sense on this premeditated um, repentance. It would be like this. We don't really live in a nation that has persecution of the church to any significant extent, although it seems like where we're headed. However, if you were living in a country and you knew that there was going to be a government crackdown and you decided, well, I'm going to bail for a little while and, and uh, things sort of ease up, I'll sort of, you know, come back. You know, it's, it's premeditated, okay? It's willful. And it's not tolerated by God, and it wasn't tolerated by the eldership of the early church. So if you hold that position, this term crucify again totally makes sense. And the term crucify again is used in the present tense. So many people hold the position that you cannot restore somebody that is in active rebellion. You know, the problem with that position is that it's pretty self-evident, right? Um, somebody doesn't want to come back, you're not going to convince them to. So you can't restore somebody that does not want to be restored. However, these people have no respect for Christ, and they disgrace him again. So that is this crucify again. It's a metaphor, okay? It's not that you're actually doing the crucifixion. You are disgracing Christ by doing this action. The term restore is also used in the present tense. You cannot keep restoring people who keep apostatizing over and over. There's a certain point, or more correctly, uh, uh, people will not turn from sin. They just don't have the desire to do it anymore. They're hard. So understand that the author is talking about apostasy. He's not speaking of ordinary weaknesses and failures that go with being human. Falling short is not the same as falling away. Remember Peter's denial of Christ. Did Peter totally apostatize and fall away? No, he did not. He came back. So it's one thing to yield to sin. It's another to abandon the Christian life altogether. And we talked about willful sin, and this position is supported by Hebrews 
10, 26. It's a matter of choice. There are consequences to apostasy. And the entire point of this passage is simple. Do not commit apostasy. All right? It's simply that. Now the question is this. At what stage do you commit apostasy? We really don't know what the word apostasy meant to the Hebrews' author. It's not clearly defined. Does that mean that you quit coming to church? Does that mean you left the church and you joined the synagogue? That's a good question. Can a person come to a point that they do not care for their salvation? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you can get to a point that you do not care for your salvation. So secondly, does the passage refer to people who had miraculous gifts and turn their back on God. Remember that there's a reference to laying on a hand that we discussed, and those who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, those are people with spiritual gifts, and the powers of the age to come. You know, Hebrews 4, 6 is only a few verses away from the foundational list that lists these elementary principles. And that could be a connecting link. To me, it would be the case that it would be more condemning for somebody who had miraculous gifts, who apostatized, epistemy, fell away, since miracles show God's word. If you were able to do miracles and you left the church that, to me, would seem to be more destructive. Because you, you had the power that you could heal somebody, and obviously you knew that it was God's power. So it would seem to be more condemning to those people who had miraculous abilities than not. Whatever your interpretation of verses 4 through 6 is, the author does distinguish of the two. In verse 6, once enlightened, have tasted, have become partakers, or as I mentioned, past tense. They've already occurred. Obviously, crucify again to restore our present tense. It's something that's currently going on. It seems to me, to summarize matters, that the author is stating that people who live in a deliberate, deliberate, disobedient lifestyle, and they have a willful, persistent, ongoing rebellion against God, and they are unrepentant, cannot be restored, and are apostate. So, and this would support his position in 1026. So, the passage does not teach that the unsaved cannot repent. It's talking about Christians. And if you have a deliberate lifestyle that is contrary to the gospel, and you have a willful rebellion against God, and you are unrepentant, you can't be restored. And obviously you don't want to be. Questions? I've got two minutes. Maybe I can get through one verse in two minutes. Two verses, rather. Seven through eight. Now, the dangers of apostasy by the 
effort necessary to produce maturity is productive. That is, you spiritually mature. Soil that is not cultivated, you get weeds, you get unwanted vegetation. And that's a failure to mature. What do you do to that? You cut it down, you burn it, and this is the result of failing to mature and the end result being hell. So the result of apostasy in this analogy is destruction. If people truly apostatize, that is, they deliberately continue to sin and are not repentant, you cannot bring them back. It's the sin and the death. You cannot restore them, according to the author. And that is, again, discussed in chapter 10. The audience needs to recognize that leaving Christianity for Judaism has its consequences. That's a good place to stop. Thank you for your attention.